When asked for a transitional species, evolutionists will often refer to whales. They present fossil after fossil of supposed transitionals. They never explain how they know any of these fossils ever reproduced. As Dr. Kent Hoven once said, the only thing a fossil can tell you is that it died. It cannot tell you if it had any babies, let alone different ones. To date, there is no proof that any of these supposed whale ancestors ever gave birth to each other, let alone a modern whale. Seems like a lot of evolutionary assumption to me. I just had to investigate. In science, an assumption is not necessarily a weakness. In fact, it's how a theory is tested. For example, the theory of universal common descent states that all living organisms on this planet share a common ancestor. Because whales and all other cetaceans are mammals, assuming common descent, we can predict that we should find several species in the fossil record which demonstrate transitional features between land mammals and whales. What's more, we should expect to see them appear in chronological order in the fossil record. All whales and dolphins make up the infraorder Cetitia. Cetitians are defined as having streamlined bodies and two external limbs that are modified into flippers as well as having internal hind limbs. There are two parva orders of cetaceans. Mysticeti, also known as baleen whales, contains blue whales, gray whales, humpback whales, and any other filter feeding whales. And Odontoceti, which includes dolphins, porpoises, orcas, sperm whales, and beaked whales. If they are descended from a common ancestor, we should find at least one transition in the fossil record for the mysticetes from having teeth to having baleen, which are the fibers they use to filter food. In 1966, Douglas M. Long discovered what appeared to be the skull of a baleen whale just off the coast of Oregon in Oligocene deposits. M. Long named it Iotacetus, and within the next decades there were four separate species discovered spanning from areas in Canada, Mexico, and as far away as Japan. In 1998, Bruce J. Welton discovered and excavated an Aetiocetus skull from the Oregon coast. In 2008, analysis performed by Thomas A. Demir and Annalisa Bird discovered that the upper jaw had very small yet distantly spaced teeth as well as vascular nutrient pinholes called foramina, indicating the presence of baleen. Berta had also discovered the very same dual features in another whale skull first discovered in 1968, classified as Chonocetus. Neither of these genera are likely to be the ancestor of modern baleen whales, but they do show the exact transitional features common descent predicted in roughly the same strata. It may also be worth noting that baleen whales all possess teeth during embryonic development that are later absorbed. Absorbed. Assuming common descent to be true, we should expect to find fossils of ancient whales which have the features basal to all of them, yet also show tiny underdeveloped legs. In the early 1830s, Richard Harlan at the American Philosophical Society received a fossil of a tooth and an enormous vertebrae from Judge Bry of Arkansas and Judge John Cree of Alabama. Considering the tooth to be just a shell, he focused on the vertebrae. Thinking it to be a giant lizard, or perhaps a dinosaur, he suggested the name Basilosaurus, meaning King Lizard. After gaining more and more fossils, from the original site in the Louisiana hillside, Harlan presented a reconstructed skull to Richard Owen. Owen discovered that the sockets of the molar teeth indicated that they had two roots. This is a feature only seen in mammals. Noting the similarity of the tooth to whale's teeth, Owen determined Basilosaurus to be a whale. After multiple other discoveries, in the mid-1890s, the Smithsonian Institution sent Charles Schuchert to collect Basilosaurus specimens for the U.S. National Museum of Natural History. He recovered the front part of one skeleton and the back part of another, which were combined as an almost complete composite. What nobody expected was that the skeleton included pelvic bones and part of an upper leg. Subsequently discovered Basilosaurus back legs actually have digits. Like modern whales, the pelvis of Basilosaurus was detached from the spine. Being that this family is always found in middle to late Eocene deposits, it is once again the confirmation of the exact features found in the exact strata that the theory predicts. Incidentally, to this day, dolphins and whales are occasionally found with fully formed back legs. Some even include hooves. So far, the specimens I've discussed have been obligated to swimming. If we assume the veracity of common descent, we should expect to find specimens in older strata with a similar body structure but with limbs allowing for walking on land. In 1903, Richard Markgraf discovered a cranium and most of the body of a species 
species with bacillosaurian features, yet with much more developed hind legs. Dubbed Protocetus atavus by Eberhard Fraz, this species appeared in the scientific literature in 1908 in a paper by famed dinosaur hunter Ernst Stromer after several more specimens were found. As more and more individual specimens were discovered, it became clear that Protocetus was not just a genus, but an entire cladistic family containing several species, including Rhodocetus and Myocetus, which was found containing a fetus positioned to be delivered face first, suggesting that it gave birth on land. In 1975, Ashok Sani and Shreya Mishra discovered yet another skull invertebrate. Assuming it to be a species of Protocetus, they named it Protocetus harudiensis before Ashok Sani noted significant enough morphological differences and assigned the specimen to a new cladistic family, Remingtonocetidae. Since then, the clade is now known for at least six different genera. According to stable oxygen isotopes analysis, this clade represents the point of no return for living in an ocean environment. In 1994, Professor Hans Thewissen discovered an 80% complete skeleton of another species of cetacean. Called Ambulocetus, according to stable oxygen isotopes analysis, this cladistic family lived mostly in fresh water, but could hunt in salt water, having to return to fresh water to drink. In 1958, Richard Dem and Therese Zhu Eddington Spielberg identified yet another ancient cetacean, this time with far more pronounced legs, indicating that it could walk on land, but preferred the ocean. Initially calling it Ichthyolestes, it was the first of many fossils to be discovered in the family Pacacetidae. In 1970, Indian geologist A. Runga Rao found a few teeth and parts of a jawbone. Calling it Indohias, he believed it resembled some sort of pig. By the time he died, many of the rocks he'd found had yet to be broken open. In 2006, after obtaining the rocks from Ranga Rao's widow, Hans Thewissen was working on them when his technician accidentally broke one of the skulls they had found. Thewissen recognized the ear structure of the auditory bulla formed from the ectotympanic bone in a shape which is found only in the skulls of whales and dolphins, as well as all known transitionals. All of these fossils appear chronologically, showing the development from land mammal, to aquatic mammal, to oceanic mammal, to the modern whales we see today. Assuming the common descent is correct, we should also be able to go back to these fossils and see the migration of the nasal cavity from the tip of the snout to the top of the head, while also seeing the slow development of the ear to the modern form of the whale. In fact, all species of Indohyus at 50 million years ago and Pachycetus at 49 million years ago possess a nasal opening on the end of their snout and ears located near the tops of their head, with Pachycetus's ears located a bit further back. At just less than 49 million years ago, the nasal cavity in Ambulocetus and Remingtonocetus has begun migrating backwards, while their ears continue migrating back and down. At 48 million years ago, the Protocetids continue to show this trend of migration. At 41 million years ago, the Bacillosaurid nostril is halfway up the skull from the snout, while the ears have settled in virtually the same place they appear in modern whales, on either side of the skull, near the bottom. Even after the split between baleen and toothed whales, both Adiocetus at 34 million years ago, and Chonocetus at 28 million years ago, also show further migration of the nasal cavity, as does the toothed whale Squalodon at 33 million years ago. In my investigation, I literally found thousands of specimens representing over a hundred genera of cetaceans in various stages of development from land mammal to ocean behemoth. Even if none of them are ancestral to modern whales, isn't it a little coincidental that common descent predicted the discovery of fossils showing all of these transitional features in the exact locations in which they were found? This is why a theory is far more useful in science than a mere fact. A fact is just a single indisputable phenomenon. A theory, through prediction, leads to the continued discovery of even more facts. And that's another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.